It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. This week we are blending it up and we are tasting some Livermore Valley wines with winemaker Robbie Meyer. It's all the usual bits, drinking on the show, wine radar and the factoid, but they're all thoughtfully integrated into this interview and taste along. So let's talk a little bit about Robbie before we jump into the interview, shall we? Yes. Robbie Meyer joined the Murrieta Wells winemaking team as director of winemaking in 2015. In this role, he focuses on small lot harvesting and blending, working to ensure that the vineyards are performing well, and the wine quality and style showcase the very best of this historic estate. Robbie's love of food and wine began at an early age in his native city of Marietta, Georgia, and led him to serve as restaurant wine steward when he was 18. It was his love of food and wine that brought him to study winemaking in California. His studies in plant sciences and chemistry at the University of Georgia were a great match for his graduate work at the University of California, Davis, where he received his master's degree in enology. Prior to joining Murrieta's Well, Robbie spent several vintages working with vineyards and wineries in Napa Valley, Sonoma County, and Santa Barbara. He has worked at Peter Michael Winery, Lewis Cellars, and Jericho Canyon Vineyards, to name a few. And in addition, he is consulting for several winemaking projects in Napa Valley and Santa Barbara, as well as making wine for his own label, Pearson Meyer, which some of you may remember as Langevin. Robbie lives in northern Napa Valley with his wife and two sons. Enjoy the interview, everybody. All right, Robbie. Well, thanks for being with us here today. And we want to know all about Muriet as well. And, you know, some of the background on how you got there and how did even the winery get get started? So take us back in time, please. Yes. Well, we'll have to go way back into the 1800s uh, when um, Louis Mel, uh, famous for bringing cuttings over to California and the United States and developing agriculture in the Livermore Valley, um, uh, developed a, a, a winery site, Vineyards and Winery, on the property uh, in the 18, late 1800s. And, um, you know, we have some of the first original cuttings brought over uh, from Chateau Akem as well as Chateau Margaux that Louis Mel brought over and uh, propagated at the vineyard site and, and winery site. And he actually built the winery. It was really one of the first effectively gravity flow wineries in California on site. And if you have the opportunity to visit us in Livermore, the winery building itself is just beautiful. You know, he he pulled materials out of the arroyo. So all of the gravelly rocks and cobbles that come out of the arroyo, he pulled that out to assemble the concrete walls um, that make up the winery building itself that still stand in great form today. So it's really cool to actually look at the walls and see the, the what's really the soil composition and the fact that it was built, you know, now, what, 120 years ago plus. Uh, it's really a cool part of California history. Oh, that's um, impressive. So, that's uh, that's the winery site that w Louis Mel put together. Now, you know, the Wente family acquired the property in the 1930s when Louis Mel was uh, getting out of the business and the Wentys were next door neighbors, loved the property, loved the plantings that he had uh, selected and put in. So uh, they purchased the property and um, and have had it ever since. Now, the winery building itself was really uh, unused for many, many years. And uh, it was really the fourth generation of the Wente family, that would be uh, Eric Wente and Phil Wente and Carolyn, um, that decided, hey, let's uh, take this beautiful, beautiful old building and bring it back to life and create uh, you know, a new winery around that. And so that was the founding of Myriad as well. And uh, Myriad as well was named after Joaquin Myriad, if people know California history, Joaquin Murrieta was that kind of legendary bandito horse runner, um, you know, back in the day. And it was told that he would take his horses to this spot of the Livermore Valley for the best water. We have an artesian well on the property there, and that was considered the best water around. And so we named the well Murrieta's well and named the winery 
Myriad as well after that. And so that was really uh, Phil Wente who was putting that together and and uh, came up with that uh, that concept. So that was really in the 1980s, and we've been going strong ever since, and developing our various wines, working on our vineyards, and um, and going from there. Well, and I can see that some of these wines that we have in front of us are named kind of after this bandito. I mean, with the spur and the whip, and it, I can see the theme here. Yes, that's that's definitely the. Uh, the naming of those two wines. Uh, so, of course, we we do uh, at the winery produce all of our varietally uh, labeled wines. So we have some, all of those things we bottle as varietally designated wines, and then we do our blends. And so we have our white blend and our red blend. And we wanted to have you know a name that kind of was unique and proprietary and identified something. So going along with that that theme, uh, the whip is our white blend that has that, you know, fresh, lively acidity. It's a, you know, very friendly, beautiful fruit forward wine. Um, but it's very much a food wine as well and has that nice, uh, whip to the palate. And then, um, the red blend being the spur, uh, is, uh, you know, from a survey of all the, the vineyards on our property, both of these are estate blends and the spur has that great, you know, tannic structure that makes it a great food wine as well. Um, so that's where we kind of came up with the, the whip and the spur. I have a question cool. for you. You mentioned yes. the cuttings that came over from France, and I'm always interested in the wine way back. Do you make any wine? Are there still vines uh, from that time? Do you have any 100-plus-year-old vines there, and do you make wines with them? So, the and that's what's great. You know, we can talk about how I began to work with the, the Winty family and that myriad as well. But, you know, what I always say is that it was, you know, it really is now a part of California history. You know, they, they have been farming these uh, vineyards for 130 years. You know, it's, it's really special and very, very unique. And so when we talk about plant material and bringing cuttings over, um, you know, that's that's how the plants were first brought, you know, cultivated in Europe and then brought over um, to the United States. And these are some of the first cuttings that were ever brought over that the Winties and that Louis Mel brought over. Um, the Chardonnay selection that came from Montpellier was brought over to Livermore. So these are kind of the California origins of these varietals now and these cuttings. So when we take plant cuttings to a property, we bring them on the property as budwood. And we grow new vines from those buds. So it's the same clonal material that was brought over, the same plant material that propagates into new plants. And then we can take cuttings from those plants and propagate more plants and more plants and so on. And a lot of people don't understand that's what the term clone means, is when you take a piece of budwood that is a genetic clone of the mother plant that you brought it from. So we propagated that around the property. And that genetic material has never left the property. Uh, well, of course it has because people have used the Winty clones of the Chardonnay <laughs> right, and right. lots of, but, and we have maintained the genetic material on site ever since. That's not to say that we have the original vines that Louis Mel propagated that are 135 years old or whatever the case may be. No, we don't have those plantings that we're producing wine from, but we have genetic material that came directly from those plants. So um, the life of a vineyard, you know, we, we can get vineyards to survive for a long period of time. But at a certain point, um, usually those vines or vineyards meet some sort of decline, whether it be from pests or disease or you know, all sorts of things. Of course, phylloxera are, are very epidemic type of, of situations. But um, we can always pull out the vineyard and take the budwood and replant the vineyard with new, fresh, young um, material. And so those what we have now is effectively the ancestors of those vines. And that's what I was going to say. So it's not so much that the great grandmas and great grandpas are still with us, but the direct descendants are. That's exactly right. That's I love exactly that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and speaking of which, tell us what makes Livermore Valley so distinctive and, and the terroir there. And, you know, why is it a great place to make wine? Right. Well, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people about that. They like to know people seem to be less familiar with Livermore Valley than several other of the growing areas in California or around the world. And it is kind of funny because we have this great history in Livermore. But, um, you know, there are some unique things about Livermore. For one, um, you know, it runs east and west 
a lot of the the wine valleys around the world, Napa and Sonoma, but you know Burgundy and Bordeaux, they're running north and south. And so right. we have this direct influence from the San Francisco Bay and from the higher hilltops on the, the the property. You can look back and see, you know, kind of the the gateway, the mouth of the bay coming up, and the the influence, the marine influence that comes right up the Livermore Valley directly from the coast, from the ocean, that pours right into the Livermore Valley. So you have very, very cool areas, you know, in the morning and in the evening when the fog rolls in and rolls back out, you have a direct influence. In other areas, it might be kind of passing. The the cold air gets hung up by certain hills and uh, mountain regions, and so it gets blocked from the actual valley. So this, you have the direct influence up and down uh, the valley, which is is quite unique. So you have weather temperatures, of course, but you also have the cooling winds that prevail, that blow through um, the Livermore Valley. So it makes it entirely different. Um, We can have quite warm days, which are excellent for ripening, but it will, you know, invariably cool down immediately in the evenings and stay quite cool in the mornings for a period of time, which helps, of course, helps us maintain that beautiful acidity in the wine. So it's a very unique place um, just from its location alone. Um, Soil types, you know, we have, um, you know, distinct soil types there, you know, uh, on the property. Um, But basically, I can say they're all forms of gravelly loam which, you know, is common in the best wine regions. Um, it's not necessarily uniquely uh, that much different from uh, what you would expect to find in Napa or in Europe in many locations. The key is when we farm, and what we do at Murad as well, is I like to talk about farming by the acre. We talk a lot in the wine world about terroir and about mm-hmm. these bigger things about Appalachians. True, there are weather right. conditions there. Hopefully we're all picking some relatively good spots to grow mm-hmm. grapes. But I want to talk about farming that one acre. What happens on that one acre within 500 acres is very unique to an, another parcel of land, you know, just 10 acres over or something like that. So the way we approach our vineyards is acre by acre. So we're going to farm that one acre depending on its aspect, depending, depending on uh, the soil type, depending on the water that gets to that one acre. The water on that acre might be different, again, than the one 10 acres away. Um, we decide what varietal we're going to plant on that one acre, what rootstock we're going to plant on that acre. And then once we farm it, we're farming it relatively uh, relative to what's happening uh, on that piece of land. So you know, if we're farming 400 acres, we effectively have 400 different things that we're doing. Wow. Um, but but we, we work very carefully with, um, you know, the vineyard management to make sure that that happens. And it starts off, with, again, with our plantings and then to our irrigation blocks and then how we do our canopy management throughout the year and pruning and all of that training um, goes really acre by acre. So we don't have a Sauvignon Blanc protocol. We don't have a Cabernet protocol per se. We have what's going on on that one acre of land. That's the way we like to farm. Is that something that you had a vision to do and you changed what was happening there when you came on board? Or is that something that had been going on there for a long time? Well, I think that that's, it's, you know, everyone... Uh, especially too with with Winty and again the the relationship I have with them and and with Carl it's always about what can we do to do it better 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 it's always you know striving to be better and better and so people a lot of great you know winemakers and and grape growers the idea is to farm attentively and assiduously and picking you know the right things to do so it's just a way that I verbalize it of let's look at it one acre by one acre you know, because they do have a lot of, you know, uh, vineyard blocks to work with, which is kind of, you know, a blessing and a curse. You have a lot of vineyard blocks to work with. You can't treat them all the same way. And no one treats, you know, their entire vineyard the same way. Okay, well, let's look at that. Let's not also treat every varietal the same way. So I might have Sauvignon Blanc planted in four different locations around, you know, the entire property. I can't treat each one of those the same. So I'm just focusing on saying, hey, let's verbalize this. Let's talk about farming one acre by one acre. And if you just check it off the list one at a time, it makes it much easier. And when we work with the viticultural team on how we're going to address that, and, and down to the actual, you know, the, the vineyard worker who is working on a single plant, if he understands the philosophy, hey, what's going on right here? 
you know, you don't have to think big picture about this is Cabernet or this is whatever. What is our objective? And he's just addressing that one plant on that acre of land. It makes it a lot easier to take care of. So, and you make the right decisions if you're just addressing it for what's going on right there. So, I think that's really interesting as we look at the, like Steph mentioned earlier, and I'm looking at your wine notes here, because for right now I'm sipping your whip, the white, and right. you mentioned the different blocks in the vineyards, in the descriptions, that's the right. Sauvignon Blanc from Louis, Louis Mel and what have you. So, so it's very interesting to take into account that the Sauvignon Blanc in the Louis Mel vineyard could be possibly trained differently. Like you said, canopy management would be different depending on vigor and right. dirt and irrigation and water and aspect and sun and all those things versus the Sauvignon Blanc and let's say another another plot. So I think that's, that's right. really interesting because a lot of people, and especially for those of us who go to school, you know, we're taught, well, in this part of the world, yes. they train this vine like <laughs> this and you should yes. know the root stalks and you should know the pruning that, you know, especially if it's in Europe, a vine training regulation as far as right. how they have to do it. And so it's kind of like, and this is an early budding variety and it should be pruned this way. And so it's, <laughs> yeah. it's nice to hear that the thing that I often say in wine is nothing is definitive. That's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right. And that, again, is the fortunate thing of where we are. You know, in California, we are not beholden to these archaic re laws that, you know, you can only do this type of, you know, work or that type of work. And I appreciate those things. I know why they're in place, etc. But, um, uh, we do. We memorize all these facts and figures and think it has to be a certain way. Um, and, and to me, that can be oftentimes more confusing, just like what I was saying uh, about ignoring, quote unquote, terroir. You know, we, we talked about a lot of things that are definitive of terroir. But if, if we just ignore that concept and if I say to someone, what's happening on this acre of land, everybody gets that. Everyone, it sounds you know, more organized, actually, it you know, totally does. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It's, you know, it, it's something people can relate to. You know, they all realize that on the in, if they you know relate it to their yard, you know, they understand that it rains, you know, a certain amount here versus over there or that, you know, there's a weak patch in, in your lawn because of these soil types versus over there. And so if people are just farming for the, the, the one acre at a time, it makes it a lot easier to comprehend. Well, that's totally fascinating and, and yeah. kind of moving on from the all the things that happen in the different plots of land in your vineyard, you've got to bring those grapes in and blend them into wine. So I think we want to talk about the wine now that's in our glasses. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So the whip and, and, this, and it hopefully as all wine should, it ties directly into the viticultural conversations that we have. So what do we have at Muriat as well? We have... 500 acres that we take care of and uh, on that property on those 500 acres we have a lot of varietals planted we have Sauvignon Blanc we have Chardonnay we have Viognier we have Muscat Canelli and Orange Muscat and lots of fun and unique varietals and you know a lot of these varietals were planted over the course of many many years and whoever might have been uh, doing the viticulture at the time would have, you know, researched the, the area of land and decided, hey, this is what we're going to plant. And so we're coming into the picture now where we have old blocks of Sauvignon Blanc, old blocks of Viognier, et cetera, et cetera. And all we want to do is we want to, again, farm each one of those blocks so that we make the best Viognier possible, that we make the best Chardonnay possible. That's, and by possible, I mean, how is that land uh, oriented and how can we get the best characteristics out of that Viognier, whatever it might be. And when we bring it into the winery, we're going to make Viognier and then we're going to make Chardonnay and we're going to make Sauvignon Blanc and we make each varietal in the winery to be the best that it can be. And of course, that is, is relative to whatever my definition of great is, but um, we're going to make it uh, the best that we can do. And only after those wines are made do I sit down at the blending table and assemble these wines. And so the whip is really, really unique because it's all estate fruit. We farmed it all as individual varietals. We produced it as individual varietals. And then at the end, I'm going back and doing the, you know, the blend itself uh, in the winery. And, uh, you know, it's, it's for our fans uh, who have followed the, the whip over time, you know, the production kind of goes up and down. 
because we're trying to have a consistent wine from year to year. You know, we want it to be very, very special aromatically to have that beautiful um, floral component, a strong floral component, along with the fruit component. On the palate, we want it to be, um, you know, a palate of, palate of substance and texture and weight and density. And being a great food wine, we want it to finish with a beautiful acidity. So that's what I'm considering when I'm putting this blend together. So I'll sit down at the blending table. I know I can reach for certain things to get that beautiful fl floral elements everywhere from the, the Sauvignon Blanc to the orange Muscat. Sometimes I, I'll use Muscat Canelli. Um, lots of fun varietals I can use for the really striking aromatic profile. And then I'm going to build the palate out. And what do we use to build the palate out? Well, certainly Semillon. Chardonnay, even Viognier can have a lot of weight and texture to it. So we're going to incorporate those to really build out the palate. And then we want it to finish with a beautiful acidity. How do we do that? Well, we have beautiful Sauvignon Blanc that we can bring and it has that striking acidity to it. So bring that back into the blend and put it together that way. And so I'm kind of doing that um, without focusing on I need, you know, X number of barrels or X number of tons of Chardonnay. I'm just kind of pulling off of the spice rack and putting them together. And when I put that blend together, well, presto, that's what we have. And what we have is what we have. We don't have, you know, um, a marketing team saying, well, we need precisely, you know, seven, 75 barrels, whatever the case may be. It's more that we put it in place and say, hey, we have this beautiful blend. We made 120 barrels. That's what we have this year. Great. You know, and so it's it's a, a fun thing to do, a lot of fun, the art of blending that it takes to put it together to make it consistent from vintage to vintage. Um, it's a great challenge and a lot of fun. Well, and we're drinking the tw 2015. So you're saying it's pretty consistent from year to year. The people who are the fans of the whip, yes. they could expect that, you know, the next uh, vintage would be pretty similar to this. Is that That's right? right? That's okay. right. So you can get the consistency from uh, vintage to vintage. And what, what is to be understood there is that's kind of the art of blending, that each one of those varietals is going to be unique vintage to vintage, right? We've grown right. it with respect to the vintage, and we've produced it with respect to the vintage. And now I have all these different wines that I want to get a consistency of a blend out of. So if you look at the back label, and you look at there's each percentage of each varietal on the back label, that's going to change from year to year. I don't, I don't even know if I, without looking what that composition is by percentage of the 2015, because I'm not looking at it in terms of numbers. I'm looking right. at it in terms of aromatic profile and the profile of the palate and finish and all of that. So those can change from year to year. What hopefully, and what, what my feedback is from our, our fans is that we deliver a consistent product from vintage to vintage. And sure, we want to make it better every year and we want to refine it every year and do our best, you know, better and better and better year after year. But the idea is in place that that's the, the essence of the blend. Can I just say that it's really great to have a different perspective on blends in wine. And, you know, I had a, I had once an old world winemaker say that, yes, new world winemakers aren't handcuffed by production rules. And this is something that a lot of places in the old world, classic places, couldn't do. But mm -hmm. when I first put my nose in this glass and I got the pretty flower, you know, and then, you know, you've yeah. got the fullness on the palate and then you've got the acid from the Sauvignon Blanc. Well, listeners, this is what each grape brings to the party. And I think you explained that so well that a lot of people write off blends because yeah, right. they're like, oh, I just like Cabernet. I like Chardonnay. But the whole reason that we blend different grape varieties is because each one brings something different to the party. You know, whether it's the tannins in the red wine or the acid in the white wine or even acid in the red or softness or red fruit or black fruit or aromas like flowers. And it's just so exciting to hear you talk about how you create this profile. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the wine world is vast, right? And, and that's, it's sometimes very confusing. And I think that's why people sometimes are kind of cautious of blends, you know, speaking directly to, you know, California and our, sorry, the United States really, and our perception of wines. Of course, we went through the whole thing where we we're labeling things a long time ago as, as Chablis or as, you know, red burgundy. And, and that was to try to help people identify with something that they had a notion of. And then we corrected that and we said, okay, 
we're going to label everything as Chardonnay or Cabernet Sauvignon, and this is the varietal, and this is what the varietal should be. And now we're, we're removing that concept with a blend and saying, you know what our number one objective is? Is to make you happy. Yeah. <laughs> we're not, we're, we don't have any, any uh, particular uh, rules in place with a varietal. When, and at Mirad as well, you know, like I said, we do present a varietally bottled Sauvignon Blanc. And I, I love varietal typicity too. So when you have our Sauvignon Blanc, yes, look for those things that you consider to be varietally specific or the Merlot or Petit Verdot. But when we have blends, the idea is that just for it to be fun and delicious and a food wine and all of those wonderful things. And that's what's really fun about blending. And I had to tell you, I had to tell you both that I was tasting these wines before 10 a.m. this morning, Good girl. and and uh, I was smiling the whole time. And I mean, I was like, this whip, I wanted to have a full glass even at 9:50 in the morning. It was so juicy, yeah. and and it really just has this tremendous expression, you know, aromatically. And, and then it just, it feels so good on your palate that it's almost like you're having a fruit salad. So I could have justified it in my head to have it like as a second <laughs> breakfast. I think. That's right. We give you permission to do that. Okay. That's right. That's right. It's not five o'clock and we don't care. That's right. That's right. The pretty nose on that. I, I see that stuff. It is going to be a food friendly wine and it's something you want to have at the table that will be a crowd pleaser. Yes. That's right. And, and also with, you know, uh, the fun thing, too, about blends, whether it's white or red, um, they also have a, a wider range of foods that they can pair with. So, you know, I have certain things, of course, that, that I would like my Chardonnay with that I might not pair with my Sauvignon Blanc or the Sauvignon Blanc and not with the Chardonnay or with red wines, the same, same idea. But with blends, we kind of cover a lot more ground. And so it's really fun when you have, you know, if you go out to, to dinner uh, at a restaurant and you have six people ordering six different menu items, it's always hard to, to pair with wine. So when you have some of these blends, they can cover a lot more ground and make it a lot more friendly. Oh, yeah, that would make it Psalm's job that much easier. OK, I want acid. I want body. I want fruit. I want flowers. I want roundness. <laughs> I want richness. And I All wanted right. to stand up to the flavor profiles of my pepper steak. Go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's hilarious. Well, I have another one more question about the whip before we move on. Yeah. Tell me about your choice in screw cap. Yes. Well, this is an interesting question. And uh, with Myriad as well in particular, a lot of our fans will first recognize that we have uh, changed our packaging over the last couple of years. So um, the packaging that you're seeing there is, uh, is a new uh, change for us. And what we're trying to refocus with Murrieta as well in general is that, yeah, that's a very fun story about Joaquin Murrieta, et cetera. But the story is not really about that fun idea. The story is about the fact that we farm our state vineyards and make these wines from what we're growing. And so we're trying to bring it back to our winery and our vineyards and, and what we're doing there. So that's part of our rebranding image there. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we try to be modern and listen to the requests that we have from our restaurant friends and uh, both our direct-to-consumer friends at home and what they like. And a lot of people are interested in a screw cap. We actually did screw cap on both the whip and the spur. Oh. And uh, the spur has now reverted back to a, a regular cork finish. And this is really a matter of taste and preference and style. And, you know, for me personally, I do favor the romanticism of having the cork finish. I like that. I like the way it looks. I like to pull the cork. I like the sound of the cork. I just like the cork finish. Um, however, I very much appreciate that a lot of times someone might open up a bottle of wine and really just want to have a glass. It's very convenient with the, cruise, the screw cap to be able to return the cap and put the wine away and enjoy it, you know. Uh, tomorrow. Um, so I, I get the convenience factor of it all. So this is just a matter of presentation that we decided that, hey, okay, on the whip, it is a, a wine that is really consumed in its youth in a very friendly, fun way. And we thought that the screw cap would work there. For the rest of our wines, we decided, hey, we like the romantic nature of it. Of course, if people want to sell these wines, they do prefer to have the cork there in place. So uh, we went with the cork finish on everything else. 
Okay. Well, I think it looks great even with the screw cap, but I do kind of like the cork myself, except for when, of course, you're camping or something and you're just like, let's just get this thing open. Let's talk next here about the dry rosé. And this is from a different vintage. So this is 2016. Yes. Yes. And so that can, you know, be another interesting point that we can discuss is, you know, vintage and when these wines are ready for consumption. When it comes to wines, whether it's the whip or with Sauvignon Blanc, I do feel like uh, we consume uh, some white wines way too, too youthfully. It, It would be, you know, to our benefit to give it a little bit of time. These wines do develop, you know, after bottling, the, the, usually the palate fills out, the aromatics kind of come into balance. And so rather than necessarily having some of these wines immediately, having, you know, Sauvignon Blanc that's a year or two or three old is wonderful. A lot of people are looking, you know, when are you coming out with your 2017 Sauvignon Blanc and we haven't even <laughs> harvested it yet, you know? So, um, <laughs> so I think a little bit of patience and time is okay. When we look at something like the rosé, you know, our main objective there is fresh floral fruit and um, getting that kind of quickly to consumer. Yes, I understand that. I understand that I'm looking for those things when I open up a bottle of rosé. Not to say that this wine can mature and have some some bottle time as well, but I do appreciate rosé most often in its youth with just its floral components and fruit components. So that's oftentimes where we find the, the rosés quicker to market. But with our Myriad as well, 2016 uh, rosé, I find it most interesting uh, that the blend that we came up with, did you notice? That? Yes, who so, was? Yeah, so. The Cunois and the the Grenache. So when we're looking at the property, again, you know, a lot of these vineyard blocks were planted long before I was involved with Myriad as well. And so when we decided we wanted to do a rosé, you know, I'm always a very big fan of rosé of Pinot Noir. Well, we don't grow Pinot Noir on the property. And uh, the the Wente family has a beautiful location down in Arroyo Seco where they have their Pinot Noir. So we don't have Pinot Noir to use. A lot of wineries are producing rosés now that are really just about bleeding the existing tanks that they have to concentrate their red varietals. And so they're bleeding off a little bit of juice and making a rosé out of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, We didn't want to do that either. We wanted to go out to make distinctively a rosé. We wanted to farm it for rosé and produce it as rosé. So I looked at the Cunois and the Grenache, the Cunois in particular, because it has its natural, beautiful acidity. That was very special. I want these all of our wines at Myriad as well are food wines. You can enjoy them on their own, of course, but we want to build them so that they are great food wines. So the Cunois provides that great structure to the wine. The Grenache, I loved it as a, a rosé varietal because it has that unique spice to it. Um, so we have the, the spice quality from the Grenache. Now, as I mentioned, we're farming these for rosé. So when we go out to the vineyard, when we do our canopy management work, and we talk about getting sunlight onto those clusters, we can uh, grow these throughout the season and harvest them in such a way that we're getting the most out of their fruit floral nature uh, from the varietal. If we were making dark, still red wine out of these same varietals, you know, we might leave it on the vine for longer and we might focus on different flavor development. But here for rosé, when we're farming it for rosé, we're using that as the leading indicator. When is it at its you know, most fruit floral expression? When we bring those grapes into the winery, we're going to do a whole cluster pressing. And this is not juice that we acquired from bleeding tanks, but rather from doing whole cluster pressing of the Cunois and the Grenache. So making it uh, a very special type of juice that we're getting from the, the varietals. And then we'll do, um, you know, we're still uh, working with how we're producing this wine, doing some barrel fermentation, doing mostly tank fermentation. We, I still experiment with yeast inoculations, indigenous fermentations all of that, but the idea is that we're choosing these varietals for their unique attributes and growing them and producing them to make rosé specifically. And I'm very happy with what we ended up uh, getting to bottle. I have a question about about the harvest because, you, you know, unlike the, the sangye or the bleeding off yeah. of the tanks or what have you, you actually grow and harvest these grapes with the intention of making rosé. And I see that you harvested these grapes in October. Yes. 
what I was expecting was maybe an earlier harvest with more acidity and less phenolic ripeness or what have you. Can you talk to that a little bit? Because when does your harvest start in the Livermore Valley? Well, that's what I was going to say next is the, in the, that was a good question. In the Livermore Valley, I mean, we're starting right now. So we're in that's what I thought. August. Yeah. <laughs> and it will go well up and push, you know, right up into November, depending on the year. You know, we're almost right up until the, the rains are coming and the days are short. Um, because we remember this is, you know, a cooler uh, wine region than, say, Napa Valley is. So we have that direct coastal influence coming right up the Livermore Valley. So uh, while we have very warm days, we're having very cool nights. And so our ripening is not very fast, meaning that we get a lot of flavor development. It happens, you know, slowly over time. Certainly we have younger vineyard blocks and we have our most, you know, southern exposure, the aspect of where the vineyard is and the varietal, you know, Sauvignon Blanc from a south western facing vineyard block uh and in its first couple of years will come off the vine very very early but when we're talking about the kunwas and the grenache naturally they come a little bit later uh, where these blocks are on the property is not facing directly into the western sun so we're not having full sun exposure in that in that regard and because it's you know the cooler climate they'll come a little bit later in the season so uh, while we look at a harvest date for any pick you always have to look at, you know, where was that harvested from? I know I've had experience with some of my favorite Chardonnay that I work with over in Sonoma County. I harvested it on Halloween one year and it made beautiful <laughs> Chardonnay. Chardonnay on October 31st. So anything can happen. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so fascinating. I'm sorry to have to geek out on that for just a little bit, yeah. but it's one of those little things that we're, we're taught to be curious about and it sticks with you, but I don't yep. know. We're here we to be on? geeky. We're here to be That's geeky, right. I think, right. you know? Well, I do want to ask one more geeky thing. I mean, the alcohol on the rosé is 14, 14.1. Yeah. And is that also a reflection on this October harvest date? Well, not, I mean, of course, because if we harvested it in August, it would have less sugar when less sugar yeah. means less alcohol. However, maybe to the frustration of some people like with uh, accounting and, and marketing, I don't look at the numbers. So what I'm going to do when I'm growing the Cunoise or the Grenache for this rosé, that's my intention. I know what I'm, I'm making. I want the flavors, the aromatics to be in play. And that's the, the ripeness that I'm looking for. I'm not picking it to say, oh, if I pick it this sugar, I'm going to get 13.9% alcohol. And if I pick up this sugar, I'm going to get 14.02% alcohol. I'm saying these grapes taste delicious. Mm -hmm. This is when we're going to pick it. Of course, I'm aware of what that chemistry is, but I'm just, I'm not going to produce a wine specifically to meet a certain alcohol. You know, if it was way, way out of balance where I was up to, you know, 16% alcohol in the rosé, I'd have to reconsider and go, you know, something's not right here. If I'm producing the wine and when I'm blending it and when I'm tasting it, if uh, I don't see the alcohol, if I see everything as being in balance, then I'm okay with that. Uh, there are other varietals that you might be able to use to get a lower alcohol rosé. But um, with these varietals, that's when they taste appropriate to me when it's time to harvest. And interesting that Cunois in Chateau Neuf de Papa is often used to soften and kind of bring the alcohol down a little bit too. Right, because Syrah usually runs away from you and, mm -hmm. and you know, the things like that. <laughs> Other varietals over there, you know, uh, it's hard to get them off the vine before they really accelerate with the, the high bricks on those varietals. Well, it's funny because even though the alcohol is 14% and it's so well integrated, I didn't even notice until Steph said something. Yeah. So, yes. you yeah. know, you really don't notice it. It's very well integrated, which, like you said, is the wine is in total balance. You're not going to notice the warmth. Well, and the reason why I said it was because I, I was curious about the body on it. And that's when yeah. I looked at the alcohol because I was like, this rosé doesn't drink like any other rosé that I've had. And I was admiring the body and going, what is why, what makes this great body on here? And I was like, oh, I wonder if it's the out part of the alcohol's play on it, you know, so... Um, very nice wine, Robbie. And I must say, too, before we go on to the next one, that we don't have winemakers on very often. And so it's really fun no. to get geeky about all of this <laughs> winemaking stuff. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, so let's dig into the spur then, because I have to say, if I have to pick a favorite, this is mm -hmm. the one of the three. I'm very happy with them uh, as well, happy with the spur. Uh, and I believe you have the 2014, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so, yeah, and I just had that um, just the other day. And, uh, you know, I literally picked up the glass, smelled it and, you know, gave the the yum, like delicious. <laughs> and that's, that's what the goal is. You know, again, with this being the blend, you know, we talk about at the winery, we talk about the yum factor and is, is this yummy? Is this delicious? And, and when we have a blend, that's what we're going for. You know, it's not to say, you know, is this giving me the the new varietal nuances of Cabernet Franc, is this giving me the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, about varietals. We just want it to be yummy and delicious and go well with food. So that's our objective. And I felt like we met that objective with the, with the spur in 2014. And I think we're on a bit of a roll. I think we're doing some nice things there. So here again, this is, you know, we like to say it's a survey of our property. As I talked about with the whip, you know, we have these different blocks planted around the, the property. And so I have Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot or Petit Syrah growing, you know, throughout the property in different locations. And we're again farming those to make those individual varietals, picking them, fermenting them to make as individual varietals and then coming back at the blending table and putting the spur together with that regard. So slightly different than the whip, you know, I'm obviously looking for a little bit different aromatic profile. And, uh, you know, when both of these wines are made, you know, I'm thinking also about, you know, kind of food pairings and that this needs to be, um, you know, it has to have uh, red fruit and deliciousness, but I want it to have depth to it as well. I want the palate to have de depth to it. Uh, and the trickier part is I want it to have some tannic structure so that it makes it a great food wine, makes it a proper red wine, um, but also want it to be somewhat approachable. You know, it goes back to this idea of you're sitting down to dinner with six friends and people order six different entrees to try to have that balance that both has structure but has approachability to it. it it's a challenge to get and really being able to work with all the varietals in the blend is what helps us achieve that. So um, you'll notice that we kind of go with the idea of a Bordeaux blend, so mostly Bordeaux varietals, but we have Petit Syrah there as well that we add in, and um, that really fleshes out that mid palate, um, brings a lot to um, the texture of the wine, and, and helps us bridge that gap between being approachable and being properly structured. I also thought that this wine evoked more feelings like more emotions than it did like wine descriptions. And right. <laughs> I just thought I would describe this wine a little bit more as joyful yeah. than I would anything else. Um, I also feel that it drinks more like a $50 or, or $60 wine than a $30 wine. So I think it's um, very beautiful and um would love to share this with more people for sure. So nice yeah, job. That's... It was interesting how, how Steph got joyful, but to me it was comfort. Yes. To me, I put the nose in the glass and I get the, the red fruits and really ripe red fruits and then black fruits. And then I'm like, all of a sudden I'm in front of a fireplace. And yeah. this is like after I've been tootling around Europe and I want new world comfort, less aggressive acidity, more fruit. This is the kind of wine that I would come to. Yeah. So it's funny how it invokes different emotions in different people, which is the whole idea of wine. And it's funny that you said that, Val, because two of my notes here say outdoor dining, indoor lounging. And I was <laughs> thinking that same comfort, I think, that you were describing. I was like, I oh. feel like relaxing. <laughs> Sorry, Robbie, we should let you talk about your wine. <laughs> no, this is, this is exactly, I mean, so the, this is, you know, people ask you why why you want to be a winemaker or whatever. Well, that, if we, the idea is in place and we're able to communicate that with, you know, to you in our wines. You know, people talk about uh, is wine art, is winemaking art? And I, I usually say, no, it's a craft because if it's an art, what you have to be able to do, someone who's a visual artist or a musical artist, you know, they're taking an emotion and through their emotion, conveying it through their art to the recipient to, to receive that emotion. And when we do something like this, those things that you're describing, that's what we're trying to present. I love the idea of what did you say? Outdoor dining and indoor lounging. That's yeah. perfect. That's what we're trying to do when we're making this wine is we have those images in place and we're trying to create a wine to meet that. 
And that's what's very, very unique about doing a blend versus a varietal. I don't do that when I'm making a Cabernet Sauvignon in particular. I'm really thinking about the history of Cabernet Sauvignon, and I'm thinking about what does the varietal mean? I'm thinking about growing it in Livermore Valley, and what are those growing conditions? And I'm thinking about the specific traditional food pairings that you might do with Cabernet Sauvignon. That's what I'm thinking about when I'm making a varietal. When I'm thinking about making a blend, yeah, we're thinking about emotion. We're thinking about, you know, what it brings to the consumer right there in particular. That's what we kind of mean by the yum factor. Is it making people happy? Is it making them joyful? That's what our objective is. I like it. I like it a lot. But you know what else we really like on this show is these embarrassing wine stories. So, Robbie, do you have <laughs> do you have something to share with us that, you know, kind of put yourself out there? But, hey, you live to tell the story. Well, I mean, I'm sure I have probably more than most because I'm, I'm kind of I have the, the inclination to do embarrassing things all the time. <laughs> but um, so with my history, you know, how I got into wine, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I loved working in restaurants and I love I, I still just refer to restaurant people. Restaurant people are my favorite. I, you know, if you've worked in restaurants, you know what that means. And so I started working in restaurants when I was, you know, sixth, seventh grade, washing dishes and busing tables, et cetera. And, you know, I began to uh, get into wines when I was about 14 or 15. And my parents, you know, they'd have wine at the table, but they weren't huge wine enthusiasts. So everything I was learning was from books or word of mouth. And, you know, when you're 14 or 15 and you're from Atlanta, you haven't heard of every single wine from all over Europe. And so you're reading about these things, and sometimes you mispronounce things, uh, as you may be aware. And oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was always uh, very impressed and really wanted to uh, excited about my first opportunity to have a Vosni Romani instead of. <laughs> and I can so distinctly remember. I don't know. Maybe I was 15. Maybe I was 16. But trying to talk to someone who was one of my mentors about Vosni Romani. And, I just love and it. And him looking at me and just going, oh, Robbie, no, no, no. <laughs> and, and just that horrible feeling of, you know, oh, my God, I just, you know, it was sacrilegious the way I just pronounced that. And I'm sure that's happened to a thousand people. And I hear it all the time. And, and anyone who's out there, try to be gentle when someone has that awful mispronunciation that it's... Uh, it's just a matter of someone learning. So that I remember that. And every time I see it today, I still will go, oh, yeah, that's Bosnia Romani. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact that you even were introduced to Von Romane at that age, mm-hmm. first of all, is amazing. And second of all, I was in my, what, late 40s when I met Steph. Uh-huh. And I think I called it Bosnia Romane. I didn't know it was Von Romane. <laughs> we all start somewhere, right? Yes. I mean... Yeah. Yeah, so the fact that you got that education so young is quite impressive in and of itself. So I think that's the fabulous story. Well, I, I'm still actually, I'm, I'm red-faced and sweating right now just telling the story. So hopefully that makes you happy. <laughs> Oh, no, it's fascinating. I think we print mispronounce things all the time. And, and oh, sometimes we actually get the Forvo pronunciation side up, especially when we're going into like Croatian wines. And right. I think we had Violet Gurkic come on and, and correct us on a Plavats Mali and not Plavik yeah. Mali, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, we still do it and we study this for a living. So, you know what? It's OK. It it's all okay. good. It last okay. week, last week, I was botching all the Armenian words. And so I felt like I needed to re-record everything because I couldn't get it right. You know, I mean, it's just it is difficult because the wine world is very large and uh, crosses all these different uh, continents and uh, languages. So, you know, that's the way it goes. You know, I just think it's crazy that you're from Marietta, Georgia, and now you're working with Marietta. I mean, (laughs) yes, yes. I I hear that quite a bit. Yes. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) And I I actually have been to Marietta and at that that little wine shop, too. On the square in Marietta? Yeah, on the square. Yeah. Yeah. Last time I was in Atlanta, my husband and I had to take a little detour to Marietta to see some clients. And I got to know that little square. It's not a bad place. It's not a bad place. 
Yeah. Well, speaking of getting to know you, because Steph and I sufficiently stalked you online before we even interviewed you this morning. So we read your interview with Terwaris blog yeah. and, and all that. But how can our listeners who haven't stalked you yet connect with you and your other wine projects and with Muriette as well? Yes. Well, I mean, anytime uh, people have an, uh, a notion to come to the Livermore Valley, please do. So many people, even from San Francisco, We'll go to, you know, a lot of the Bay Area wine regions, and I meet people all the time who have yet to come to Livermore, and it's a beautiful place, so please come by and see us at the winery, uh, easy to find, Myriad as well, uh, dot com and in Livermore Valley. Uh, we have a great tasting facility, uh, and we would love to host anyone who can come by and see us there. And uh, yes, and then I, I produce my own wines as well, Pearson Meyer Wines. And uh, you can read all about us on PearsonMeyer.com. That it should be noted it is P-E-I Pearson, as opposed to the many other spellings of Pearson Meyer. So uh, P-E-I-R-S-O-N-M-E-Y-E-R.com. So those are my wines from Napa and Sonoma County. No matter really which re wine region you go to, I've got you covered. So come and visit. <laughs> <us>. <laughs> That's perfect. Be careful because we just might, Robbie, but thank you. Oh my gosh, so much for spending some time with us. We know you're busy. We've been we've been holding you kind of captive for about an hour, but unless Steph has anything else, what do you think, Steph? I think we could talk for a very long time, but um, to respect, <laughs> respect your day, we will let you get back to it. But Robbie, this was so nice. I can't really explain when I meant when we don't have very many winemakers on and we really had a fun time with you. Thank you so much. Well, I did as well. Yeah, we, we could keep talking. We'll do part two another time. All right. <laughs> We'd love that. We'd love that. Please keep in touch with us. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Good okay. luck with your harvest this year. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Robbie. Wow. We have to give special thanks and a major shout out to Robbie for being our guest today. Val and I were just so energized after his interview and uh, still feel kind of a little bit of that excitement now. So, wow, that was fun. I know. So part of the interview that you guys didn't get to hear where we were like, oh, my God, love him. Hey, it was so much fun. Oh, my God. You know, so you guys don't get to hear that part, but that's OK. <laughs> Maybe it'll show up in our bloopers reel. But what we need to do right now is do some shout outs. Yes. Shout outs to Robbie. Shout out to Emma Thomas from Balzag Communications and Marketing. She totally helped uh, put this whole interview together. And Heather Everett from Wente, she kind of sealed the deal for us. But we also have to give a shout out to Andrea Rogers from Colorado Creative Beverage Marketing. She really was the person who put planted the seed and said, hey, I think you guys should all get together and do a podcast. You know, <laughs> So here we are months later. And so thank you, everybody, for making this happen. And uh, we had a great time. And this was a, a fun show. Beautiful wines. It all worked out. We also want to send out shout outs and thank you love to our listeners and our patrons, including our tenacious tasters, Jeff E. from the We Like Drinking podcast, Lynn from Savor the Harvest, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, David and Lisa in Illinois, Jen in Maryland. It's not five o'clock and we don't care, listeners. We thank you too, Meg, Clay, John, Andrew, Aswani, Chantel, Mary Lou, Kathy, Chris and Janet, Steve, Kathy in Tennessee. We're going to have more Kathys than we know what to do with <laughs> Renee. We love you guys. Thank you so much. And thank you to our tastemaker listeners, David, all the way out there in Scotland, and Carol in Kentucky, and our wine-tastic listener, Laura. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes, thank you. And you guys, if you want access to bonus content or entrance into our monthly patron drawing for a surprise wine gift, check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash wine to five podcast. We do have some exclusive content in there for you as well. And we are here for you every single week. And even in between episodes, you can interact with everybody in the Facebook group. You can find us in the social spaces at Wine to Five. We definitely encourage you to join the private Facebook group called the Wine to Five community. And you can connect with me, Val, on Twitter. I'm at Wine Gal Unboxed. And also as Vino with Val on Facebook, Instagram, 
and every once in a while on Pinterest. Steph, well, you can find her on Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram as the wine heroine. But that's all we have for you guys. So until next week, cheers. cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash wine T-W-O five and tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips.